in a 1970s framework where you have powerful organized labor, inflation can actually be to the benefit of working people because their wages are protected. They don't have very many savings, certainly not savings in the form of nominal assets, which are subject to price erosion. And so historically speaking, all the way back to the great inflation, say the Weimar Republic, inflations are a progressive in the sense of the technical sense of progressive redistributive mechanism handling a very big bill. So if you ask who paid for World War One, in the end, it was overwhelmingly middle class and other middle class Germans who did, not working class Germans, because the inflation burns off those people's assets. That's one way of thinking about it. So long as you do have large scale organized labor to protect people's nominal incomes, if you don't, then of course, the balance is much more difficult to figure out. And it's really a gamble on the possibility of indexing various types of income streams so that those who are most vulnerable are not profoundly damaged by rapidly rising costs of living, basically. Welcome back to The Breakdown with me, NLW. It's a daily podcast on macro, Bitcoin, and the big picture power shifts remaking our world. The Breakdown is sponsored by Crypto.com, Bitstamp, and Nexo.io, and produced and distributed by Coindesk. What's going on, guys? It is Monday, August 24th, and today I am thrilled to share an interview with Adam Tooz. Adam holds the Shelby Column Davis Chair of History at Columbia University, where he also serves as the director of the European Institute. He is an absolutely prolific writer, constantly in the op-ed pages of The Guardian and Foreign Policy, as well as being known for his books The Deluge, The Great War, America and the Remaking of the Global Order, 1916 to 1931, The Wages of Destruction, The Making and Breaking of the Nazi Economy, and Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crises Changed the World. In 2019, Foreign Policy Magazine named him one of their top global thinkers of the decade. In this conversation, Adam and I discuss historical analogies for our present moment, Federal Reserve policy and independence, how much we should fear debt and inflation post-COVID-19, how the economic and political crises of 2020 have changed or reinforced the trajectory of the US, China, and Europe, and why there is no such thing as the post-American era. I'm incredibly excited to share this conversation, and I hope you enjoy it as well. All right, we are back here with Adam Tooze. Adam, it's so wonderful to have you on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. So I I was thinking about this, and I want to start with a question that I feel like must be the thing that you have gotten asked most uh, in the last few months, which has to do with what historical analogy is actually most useful to explain this moment. But maybe I try to, uh, you know, uh, ask it slightly differently. So I think that we plumb, obviously, for historical analogy, but rather than trying to say this is or isn't like, uh, you know, a, a single movement, right? This wasn't like the Spanish flu or or this isn't like 2008 in terms of our response, what historical moments have you found most useful either in how alike they are, how different they are, in in helping understand what we're experiencing right now? I I think the question is really well put that way, I think. Um, Because if you look for precise analogies, you're just really not going to find any that that are at all useful. This, This is not like 2008 in that the genesis of the shock is completely different. And the financial crisis that resulted in March and April this year is also very different in its logic. Didn't involve the banks, didn't involve mortgages, for instance. Um, And nevertheless, we were facing very serious financial disruption. Um, It's very unlike previous pandemic episodes because the response has been so dramatic, uh, both at the national and even more spectacular at the global level. This comprehensive effort at shutdown to try and contain the epidemic that way it has no analogy. It doesn't. It's, it's, there's nothing like it in the Spanish flu episode of 1918, 1919. Much has been made of you know the differential response of various American cities: Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, and so on. But there is no national response really, let alone a global collective response. I spent years working on the archival material of 1919, Paris Peace Conference and so on. And the flu just isn't a subject of conversation. Um, amongst logistical planners, perhaps in the military of the time, there was some debate about you know how to manage flows of sick people and to avoid them getting sick, but it never percolates up to the global level. So in both of those ways, it's really quite difficult to think of analogies. Moments I have found useful to think with are on the one hand, the kind of emergence of modern anxiety 
um, around invisible threats of various types, which I think we can date to the history, really, I think most prominently probably of uh, nuclear fear in the 70s and 80s. I grew up in West Germany uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, one of the countries most profoundly affected by this. I wasn't actually there at the time, but in, when the Chernobyl crisis happened, you know, the town that I grew up in, Heidelberg, was, you know, the, a, a radioactive cloud blew through. Playgrounds were closed. People had to consider whether they would go out in the street and buy milk. So that kind of modern fear, I think, is very interesting as a way of trying to think about what we've been through in experiencing this shock. And the other, uh, close in time to that, I think more generally, um, and when we think about how we've responded with monetary policy and fiscal policy and so on, I think we do have to go back to the 70s uh, in the sense that this is the moment where you see, on the one hand, the emergence of that environmental politics, but on the other hand, also, of course, the advent of the fiat money regime with the collapse of Bretton Woods and the abandonment of any gold peg for any country, any currency in the world. And a fully, therefore, fully politicized monetary constitution, which we, you know, rapidly found ways of containing through independent central banks and so on. But it's the flexibility that that provides us that has enabled the absolutely extraordinary monetary policy response we've seen to this crisis. And the third element, which also links to the present, is China. So the 70s are the moment of, you know, the first really major crisis of America as a global power. Uh, and with the wake of you know, the Vietnam crisis, the reheating of the Cold War with the Soviet Union and the China play, which of course is unraveling before our eyes 50 years on, was key to the way in which the, famously, the Nixon administration sought to reestablish America's geopolitical position. So when I think about 2020 and what's happened at this moment, it's really the unraveling or the, the full exposure, if you like, the potentialities of of that first, I think, fully modern awareness of possibility and crisis, which I which I would locate in the seventies. I think it's super super interesting points to uh, to connect this to. I was actually as we were watching the Umbrella Academy on Netflix this weekend, and it's part of this sort of long tradition of uh, post World War II nuclear based fantasy or sci fi, right? Where uh, some you know nuclear accident happens and it mutates people, and uh, and, and that becomes sort of the, the the basis of fiction. I was wondering what what type of fiction we'll see coming out of this. If if, if we will, where the threat is instead not sort of nuclear in that same way, but uh, but this unseen virus. But that's neither here nor there. I think that the the point that I actually wanted to pick up from maybe is um, this idea of. Uh, of, of what this has to do or what this reflects about the state of political leadership uh, in the world. And, you know, one of the things that was interesting and very central to your book, Crashed, was that it was sort of seductive, but perhaps a little wrong to view 2008 as it was initially viewed as an American crisis alone uh, and something sort of that was a, a, a post or, or sort of a, an example of America's decline. Um, and and I guess that the, the the question then becomes, as as has been uh, argued narratively by some, is that is this the first crisis in the post American era in some ways? I mean, I think one understands why people say that. I mean, um, the 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 performance of the Trump administration has been shambolic and and embarrassing. I think for many people. Um, it's not true to say that America's national pandemic record is, is worse than that of comparable countries. In fact, it's better than many European countries, which are much smaller, of course. So if you compare New York with London, and you end up with like for like comparisons. But in any case, the American uh, has not come out of this crisis well. So it's easy to see, I think, why people would jump to the conclusion that this is the first post-American crisis. I, I, I don't, even if you are a declinist, even if you think America's power is waning, and this is a critical moment in that, I think the idea of a post-American world is really misleading because our, the problem is, as it were, if you're in the rest of the world, is that you've got a sick and ailing America in it. If only you know it were a world without that sick America in it, that would make things a lot easier. In fact, the world is one very profoundly shaped, I think, by a crisis of American politics, by a crisis of American power, which is very uneven. So at some levels, it's shockingly manifest. Um, 
you know, the inability to act as a cooperative partner. Just forget leadership, just a cooperative partner on issues of public health, on climate policy and so on, on trade on the one hand. And on the other, the continuing role of the United States, exemplified by uh, the crisis itself, as the anchor of the global financial system. Um, whether we like it or not, the, 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 you know, the basic currency for international transactions are throughout the world is, is the dollar. Even the Chinese business sector borrows heavily in dollars. And the Fed has proved itself again um, after the shock of 2008 for the second time as a, an extremely cooperative, competent, proactive, imaginative, quite broad-minded um, hegemon. Um, in stabilizing this system and thereby enabling others to act, whether it's through the swap line system, which funnels dollars into the, you know, the leading central banks of the world, including some EM, Mexico, Brazil, South Korea, if you're willing to treat South Korea as an EM anymore, uh, or whether it's just simply through the cushion provided to the global financial system by the extraordinarily low interest rates in the US. But either way, the, the Fed is continues to be and was actually a central precondition for the crisis policy response in the rest of the world this time around as well. So what I think we're seeing is an increasing disassociation of different parts of American power. Um, and we haven't even talked about hard power and the military side. Um, what I do think we are seeing is a disarticulation, increasing incoherence, you know, the idea of a sort of monolithic American leadership or, dominance hegemony no longer makes much sense but that crisis is very much still in the world and affecting the world um so a world with an america in crisis i think is a better description than a post-american world i think that is a uh, is really interesting we, uh, part of it i wonder if it has to do with even just uh, the way that we frame things is also shaped by where we frame things. And uh, the first crisis in a post-American era sounds a lot better, <laughs> you know, it's always as a, as a headline. Yes, right? it's as a, a clean as a break, quote. right? I mean, part of the reason yeah. it sounds better is it, it's kind of neat and tidy. Whereas that isn't, that isn't, you know, that isn't our reality. Our reality is we move on, the game goes on, you know, the music continues to play, even if, bits of American politics seem, to all intents and purposes, profoundly dysfunctional and broken. Um, the world doesn't wait, the epidemic doesn't wait, the global economy doesn't wait, um, nor, however, the, does the continuity, for instance, of American power when it comes to you know, highly sophisticated military aircraft or aircraft carriers or whatever. All of that rumbles on too, despite the fact that Congress appears unable to know, conduct basic business and uh, you know, without being unduly partisan, I think it's fair to say the problem largely consists of the GOP's massive internal dissension, extraordinary difficulty of American conservatives of, in fact, agreeing on a particular position uh, and implementing it then as a form of government, which, which we saw in their, you know, botched efforts to repeal uh, the Affordable Care Act, the Obamacare, early on in the Trump administration. And as the Democrats had taken control of the House, with that kind of spectacular malfunction was less obvious because there was less ambition with regard to legislation. But with the crisis driving the need to actually generate policy, um, that, 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 that huge problem has resurfaced spectacularly this summer. So I think that's a, a great segue to another question that I had for you around um, how uh, how our expectations around monetary policy have shifted between 2008 and now. Uh, you know, some have made the comment that uh, this time around, part of what felt different is that uh, no one was bringing a no intervention or you know uh, sort of hand wringing <laughs> around around this sort of intervention. It was really just a debate about which which number to put before trillion, right? So I, I guess I'd love to see your your perspective on this. Yeah, no, I think that's that's absolutely right. I mean, you can view it from the side of the central bankers, and you can view it from the side of markets. I think, um, and in both cases, there's there's clearly a shift. Um, the holdouts. One has to say, as it were, you know, the honourable exception to this are sort of bone-hard German, Dutch, Baltic conservatives who actually did flinch at the prospect in March of massively expanding the ECB's balance sheet. And you could see Christine Lagarde as ECB president on a knife's edge. And we know precisely when it was. It was in a press conference on March 12th when she, she did, you know, she said spreads, Italian spreads, Italian interest rates are not our problem. Um, 
that lasted for about half an hour because the markets exploded um, as soon as she'd done that. And since then, the ECB has shifted. But you can see in Europe, I think, there is still a kind of concerted rearguard action of conservatives who are who are not willing to simply go down the Bank of Japan route. Um, I agree in the US. Um, we know less, I think, about what has gone on inside the Fed in the crucial weeks in March. Um, in due course, may, more may emerge, but I agree that the you know, everything was ready to go, that the team that had handled very large-scale asset purchases in 2008 was, was present and, and, and had schemes in place. And then they went hell for leather like we've never seen before. And it's important to stress just how gigantic the asset purchases were. A lot of focus has been put on, you know, the Fed's backstop for private credit and so on. But, but in terms of just the quantum leap, um, it's the you know, asset purchases running at a million dollars a second in the last days of March, um, which are really dramatic. And I agree, there was no there was no debate. Um, on the market side as well, I mean, there's that great Robin Wigglesworth for the FT quote recently where he said, you know, people will, will in, in times to come, people will tell their grandchildren of a time when, when uh, banks paid real interest. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, because after 2008, there was indeed the expectation that there would be a return to normality, that there would be a normalization, and that framed everything. Sure, there was a deviation now. Interest rates were exceptional, and the central banks was acting. But it was only a matter of time before we returned to another world. I think that historical horizon has, has shifted quite dramatically. Um, we know now that what the 10-year expectation for the 10-year Treasury which is as good a guide as we have really to market expectations about inflation over the medium term, long term really, 10-year time horizon, is now below the Fed's inflation target. So um, the market is expecting negative real returns on 10-year treasuries um, over a 10-year time horizon, which is, which is a remarkable state of affairs. Yeah, so you wrote a great uh, piece on this just recently, or I guess it was a, a little while ago, but it's, uh, I think, really relevant where the, the piece was called, Should We Be Scared of the Coronavirus Debt Mountain? And um, and basically, the, the, the I think you called it the awesome dilemma of how to balance debt, GDP, growth, inflation. And, uh, and you took to task a little bit the household analogy that we see so much, but I'd love to hear more about uh, that, that piece or that line of thinking. And, and maybe let's try to answer, should we be scared? of this debt mountain? Well, I think we're in a moment where you know, reasonable people profoundly disagree about this. Let's start from that position. Uh, and very serious money, very serious investors are taking out inflation hedges right, left, and center. Um, it isn't, as it were, a consensus in the market, because if it were, we'd see a huge upheaval in the bond market, which we're not seeing. But there is clearly a constituency of people who are profoundly worried about the inflation prospects. And you can see why, right? I mean, by any conventional measure, we're engaged in a huge inflation. I mean, the inflation once upon a time simply used to mean the expansion of the supply or stock of money. It didn't actually mean the resulting price increases. So there's a, there was a linguistic change over the course of the 20th century so that inflation became synonymous with price increases rather than the thing that people used to think caused price increases. And what we've got right now is a huge expansion of the money supply, M2, M3, all of those old measures have ballooned, but we don't appear to be any price movement at all. And so some people you know, argue uh, quite reasonably on the back of historical experience that this must surely in due course lead to accelerating price increases. And there's a supply side story you can tell about growing inefficiency in the world economy as a result of COVID, you know, a reversal of the trends of globalization, the big, as it were, one-off gains, which result, you know, which resulted from bolting on hundreds of millions of extra workers in Asia into the global labor force. All of that's over. And so you're not going to get those kind of uh, one-off uh, uh, deflationary shocks. So is the world now set for inflation and research? That I, I, it's a question that's out there. I, I take the reverse position on all of those issues. I think that um, it's just not obvious how the monetary expansion feeds through into inflation in a world in which the money just sips on bank balance sheets and has been doing so now for the best part of 10 years. I don't think that the supply side deterioration is sufficient to allow one to believe that we'll see sustained price increases above all because um, we don't have a wage price spiral. We don't have powerful trade unions that would motivate and drive uh, sustained price increases. And the pressure of global you know, competition remains serious. So to my mind, um, 
there is a you know there's it's 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 given the other priorities that we have right now and given the severity of the stresses that we're under it would be a huge mistake to prioritize inflation fighting um it would be preparing to fight the last war whereas our problem is in fact to sustain demands to restore production and to think through the structural implications of this shock for its entire service sector and so on so um for that reason i'm also relaxed about the scale of, of government debt i don't see any problem with warehousing it on central bank balance sheets even if that does involve an increase in bank reserves and therefore the potential for very rapid expansion in the money supply um there just seems to be very little um risk that that will actually uh, transpire um and so in the economic policy making is always going to be a balancing of costs and benefits and risks and opportunities um it seems that the in i i i'm i'm worried that uh, the politics of debt and debt reduction will return uh you already begin to see it in various parts of the biden camp and um it would be a huge distraction from other priorities I think it's the the point that you started with that this is a non non consensus area of discussion, and that uh, there's actually incredibly fierce debate is is one of the things that makes it so interesting and so important. I think to spend time on right now is it's uh, it, there's really really very different perspectives on this. I, I guess one you know one thing that I I know you think about a lot in your in your writing is um, the impact of uh, of sort of some of these larger forces on on uh, the socioeconomic bottom of the ladder, right? And I think that one of the other interesting parts of this debate is that both sides who are fearful of uh, a kind of a debt and austerity conversation, as well as a um, those who are fearful of letting inflation run hot, are worried about disproportional impact on the poor. How do you kind of make sense of, of those two sides of things uh, right now in the current context? I, 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 I agree, um, and you can spin the same argument that I was making both ways, right? Because in a in a 1970s framework where you have powerful organised labour, inflation can actually be to the benefit of working people because their wages are protected. They don't have very many savings, certainly not savings in the form of nominal assets, which are subject to to price erosion. Uh, and so, historically speaking, all the way back to the great inflation, say the Weimar Republic. Um, Inflations are a progressive, in the sense of the technical sense of re- progressive redistributive mechanism for handling a very big bill. So, if you ask who paid for World War One, in the end, it was overwhelmingly middle class and upper middle class Germans who did, not working class Germans, um, because the inflation burns off those people's assets. Um, so, that's one way of thinking about it. So long as you do have large scale organised. Uh, labor to protect people's nominal incomes. If you don't, then of course the the balance is much much more much more difficult to to figure out, and and it's really a gamble on the possibility of indexing various types of income streams, so that those who are most vulnerable are not uh, profoundly damaged by rapidly rising cost of living, basically. Um, so it's 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 a, it's, a, it's a fine balance. The those of us, I think, who who as it were are willing to take risks, A, just don't think there is a large risk of inflation. Um, and so that's, as it were, the first thing to discount. And then secondly, um, are also weighing the the basic Phillips curve kind of logic, which is the, the real risk here is of sustained recession and mass unemployment. Um, because if you ask, as it were, what makes the livelihoods of the worst off, more precarious, uh, what hits particularly disadvantaged uh, minority communities, notably in the United States, for instance, it's unemployment. Um, and, you know, if, if we are beating about the bush here, because we're basically talking about arguments to do with MMT um, and modern monetary theory, so called, and modern monetary theory has a wing which is about central banking and money and the treasury, it also has a wing which is about the full employment guarantee and a jobs guarantee. Um, and it has that wing because it's a social justice position, because unemployment in the United States massively hurts people with less education in lower income communities and above all people of color and no one worse than African-American men, black men who fall out of the formal labor market first when the going gets tough. 
Um, and so the full employment position, which ultimately transpired in the form of the Fed's mandate, the Humphrey Hawkins Amendment, is a late legacy of the civil rights movement. Greta Scott King, Martin Luther King's widow, was a huge advocate of a jobs guarantee because if you actually want to enfranchise, provide a stake in the society for disenfranchised, excluded black communities and above all black men, um, you have to ensure that the labor market in fact provides employment for people. And so if the trade-off is inflation risk versus unemployment, then the social justice position tends to favor you know, taking risks, running the economy hot. And I think one of the claims that the Trump administration could actually legitimately make for itself at the beginning of this year is that in a grossly inefficient way, many of us would argue, but nevertheless, in a fairly sustained way, they were running the economy hot, grossly inefficient because they were doing it by way of tax cuts, which were poorly targeted and benefited high income groups far more than, you know, was really very sensible in my view. But obviously that there's a politics to that. But in any case, the net result was an economy that was running fairly hot. And that did have a differentially positive impact on low skilled, low wage workers and particularly on African-American unemployment rates. Um, that wasn't just, you know, Trump hype. There's a, there's a true, there's a real reality to that. Um, and it is, and it is, uh, I think something that the Dems really have to think about is, is why in the past they have been as cautious as they have been. Both in Clinton and the Obama administration were profoundly cautious when it came to fiscal policy, uh, even though it, it clearly um, differentially disadvantages the communities which they claim to stand for. What's going on, guys? I'm excited to share that one of this month's breakdown sponsors is Crypto.com. Crypto.com offers one of the most cost-efficient ways to purchase crypto out there, as they've just waived the 3.5% credit card fee for all crypto purchases. What's more, with Crypto.com's MCO Visa card, you can get up to 10% back on things like food and grocery shopping. When you buy gift cards with the Crypto.com app, you can get up to 20% back. Download the Crypto.com app today and enjoy these offers until the end of September. Bitstamp is the original global cryptocurrency exchange. Since 2011, Bitstamp has been the preferred exchange for serious traders and investors. Trusted by over 4 million customers, including top financial institutions. Bitstamp is built on professional-grade trading technology. Their platform is powered by a NASDAQ matching engine, and their APIs are recognized as the best in the industry. Download the Bitstamp app from the App Store or Google Play, or visit bitstamp.net slash pro to learn more and start trading today. That's bitstamp.net slash pro. In this crisis, many investors aim to keep and grow their digital assets. Others seek to maximize the yield on their cash. Nexo allows you to achieve exactly these two goals. The company offers instant crypto credit lines against all major cryptocurrencies, with interest rates starting from only 5.9% APR. Nexo also lets you earn up to 10% annually on your fiat and digital assets. What's more, interest is paid out daily, and you can add or withdraw funds at any time. Get started at nexo.io. I think it's really interesting. I mean, one of the questions that it brings up for me is whether, and perhaps this is sort of at the center of the debate, whether the Fed is the right place for a full jobs guarantee, whether you can separate those two pieces, right? The the idea of, of full jobs as a social justice position, as you put it, and the Federal Reserve or any central bank being the mechanism by which that's implemented. Oh, no, it can't be the Fed alone. And you're absolutely right that, you know, we talk about the Fed because it's, you know, one branch of the American government and the government state machine that really does function and functions well. I mean, I used to joke that, you know, the two bits of American government that function were like special forces and the Fed. Um, <laughs> you know, so there's a sort of, so that's why we end up talking about them a lot. But no, but, a, but mm -hmm. a comprehensive economic policy obviously has to involve fiscal policy. One of the remarkable things that happened at the beginning of this crisis is that Congress showed up and actually did its job and delivered a, an expansive fiscal policy boost um, very rapidly, uh, with an unprecedented speed and on a huge scale, bigger than virtually anywhere else in the advanced economy world. I mean, the Germans did a big stimulus, but most of it was form of credit guarantees. The American fiscal stimulus was real money, um, and at least some of it, the, the stimulus checks and the, you know, the, the um, supplement to unemployment benefit was fairly well targeted. It went to the people that actually needed the income boost, though there's complex arguments about whether they spent it on the things we would have wanted them to. 
PPP is a different matter, much less efficient in terms of sustaining demand and employment. But in any case, the fiscal policy was there. And we saw close and effective cooperation between the Fed and the Treasury in smoothing out the bond market and making that work. I mean, there was a huge spasm in the amount in the US Treasury market, which really set the alarm bells ringing, in not just in the US, but across the entire world in the second and third week of March this year. That's the real story of the financial crisis of COVID, is what happened to US Treasuries starting on the 9th of March and really escalating through that week, um, uh, Monday 9th, Tuesday 10th, Wednesday 11th, Thursday the 12th is probably the absolutely worst day if you talk to people in the fixed income business. Uh, and they saw us seeing things they'd never seen before. Um, and so if you're going to do the kind of fiscal expansion that we've had to do, you need close cooperation between the Fed and the Treasury. Um, that is then a very potent package. Um, the two working hand in hand makes a very powerful combination. What's your take? So this brings up another question, which is the independence of the Fed and the Treasury, right? Because, I mean, you kind of have just argued the need for them to work in such concert in these sort of complex crises. But at the same time, there's there's uh, obviously forces from, from the top on down who are trying to break the sort of independence in some ways. Uh, do you think that that's likely to become a more salient political issue? Or is that so kind of behind the scenes that it's not going to register for most people? Well, you know, I think it's a very interesting question to watch over the next couple of weeks um, because we know how aggressive the Trump uh, campaign was in 2016 and its assault on the Fed. Um, the 2016 Trump campaign is the most vociferous that has ever been mounted against the Fed during a presidential election campaign. Certainly, probably way back to William Jennings Bryan. And, like, you know, of course, there wasn't a Fed in William Jennings Bryan day, but it was an astonishingly vociferous attack on. Janet Yellen and the people that Janet Yellen apparently stood for. Um, and we know that, you know, relations between Powell and Trump were anything but harmonious through that first week of March. You know, the, the on, I think it's Tuesday, the 10th of March, Trump is still tweeting, you know, where is the useless Fed? Why are they not showing up? Uh, we need cuts. We need stimulus now. Uh, we know behind closed doors he was abusive um, in his comments about the Fed. Um, and there was very serious concern in, in Trump's entourage that he was actually going to try and fire Powell. Um, that, of course, has all gone away. So in a sense, COVID has done the Fed a favor in making it pretty clear that the Fed has to act and removing the intense politicization that was going on. I mean, for, for me personally, the, the, you know, the, the really extraordinary moment is the previous year, when 2019, where we have you know, a former president of the New York Fed openly arguing in on the pages of Bloomberg, no less, that the Fed should not accommodate the nationalist dysfunctional trade policy of the Trump administration. In other words, they should provide a crash barrier and allow the Trump administration to fail, um, thereby prejudicing its re-election chances and restoring the possibility of the election of a president who actually respected the Fed's integrity and independence and would allow normal economic policy to resume. I mean, that's how bad things were getting. I mean, Dudley had to wait, you know, grow back and the Fed disowned any comments he'd made. But it's pretty clear that people inside the Fed apparatus were thinking precisely that. Why are we accommodating a policy which we know is destructive to the stability of the US, not just the US, but the world economy? Because every time we lower interest rates, when the, the president you know, tweets about a trade war, we are accommodating. And classically, central bankers are not you know, that is not their role. This is what their independence is supposed to be precisely that they refuse that accommodation. Um, so we were getting into some very deep water um, and COVID because it's allowed a consortium, a coordination of forces around stimulus. And the Fed, after all, is calling on Congress now to do stimulus. And Trump is also clearly asking Congress to do stimulus and they're not. So they're actually on the same page. But I think it's interesting that when I thought we might be back in that moment when, you know, what it was last week, wasn't it? When the Fed, uh, when the minutes were published that revealed that the Fed had decided not to do yield curve control and the markets didn't like the sound of that because that basically suggested that there was maybe a limit to how far the Fed would go in manipulating interest rates. That could be the zone around which we could have another flare up, it seems to me. If the markets, if we see the S&P 500 selling off in the next couple of weeks, if we see, you know, a huge hit to the big tech stocks, for instance, and the Fed doesn't respond in some way, I think 
we could see another flare up. Um, because it's, you know, the question of independence is definitely posed. Um, and not, I think, just from the right. Effectively, the MMT, the left wing position, of course, also puts independence in question because it basically says monetary policy should be subordinated, as should fiscal policy, to the priority of full employment. And everything really has to be directed towards that goal. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating. I think that the reaction to the yield curve control, uh, I mean, really like off, offhanded comments, you know, buried in those minutes was was fascinating. It was to in, see. quite intense, wasn't it? And I think yeah. you know, if we keep going down that line, where all the Fed has to say is, you know, we're not going to full, go the full BOJ route, and the markets can't live with that. You know, it's a very it's a very fine line. Um, so I think watch watch that space because you could you could easily see a return to tension um, if if the positive the good news story in in the stock market and fundamentally I think that's what that's the barometer that the Trump folks will track because they know the unemployment story at this point is not going to turn well for them by November so you know there'll be continued progress but they're not going to get the dramatic breakthrough they want so I think they need the the, the equity markets to remain strong. I mean, that was certainly last week, uh, Vice President Pence seemed to me was testing out language around this. He called it the great American recovery in a tweet, which if that's not designed for a, a campaign slogan, I don't know what it is. No, precisely. I, mean, I think that's going to be, and conversely, going back to 9th of March, I think the moment when we, I think, can say that the Trump administration really woke up, smelled the coffee and realized they, you know, they really had a crisis on their hands was when when the markets collapsed on on that Monday, so that is the that is the loop that is one version of reality, as it were, that we all are synced on. <laughs> like, uh, you know, we may not agree on many other measures, um, but you know, there's not a lot of people saying, "Hell, let's stop publishing the S and P 500," or if we only if we only collected data points a little less frequently, you know, the scene <laughs> would look good. You know, that 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 is a that is a benchmark of reality that. Um, that actually does remain a fixed point. It's not a very good measure of the overall state of the economy. It's a particularly bad measure of the welfare of the least well-off Americans, you know, because there's, for, what, 20 to 30 percent of Americans have some kind of a direct stake in equity markets. The rest really don't. The bottom 50 percent have no wealth invested in that form of any type whatsoever, despite Robin Hood and, you know, the, the huge mobilization of of uh, retail investors through those channels, which has been another remarkable phenomenon of this of this moment. Yeah, there was a there was a stat today in the Wall Street Journal: the top ten percent of earners owned eighty seven percent of stocks in Q one of this year, which is up from eighty two point four percent in two thousand nine. So when when we reduce the economy to the S and P five hundred, we're basically saying it's your it's your economy that matters to us, right. not the not the economy of the folks who are. You know, working shifts at restaurants or used to be. And I think it was a very striking moment when Powell, I can't remember, I think it was in April, where he gave testimony where he said, you know, something like 40% of households which earn less than $30,000 a year have suffered the loss of at least one waged income. You know, and that, for the Fed to be the agency that is incorporating the social dimension, the social crisis into its policy making, is itself a remarkable remarkable moment the new york fed was publishing data on 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 food on the food crisis mm -hmm. last week. um so that's a that's a remarkable shift yeah so oh man it's i could talk about the the fed all day and i'm sure many of my listeners would like that but i want to go to a couple other places because i think part of what's interesting to me is uh is these questions of how how the crisis and the response have either shifted or sort of reinforced the trajectory of key actors in the geopolitical future and so we've talked a lot about the us um, but i'm interested in your take on kind of europe and china how again the, this has either kind of shifted or or reinforced the trajectory maybe let's start with Europe, because I know that you just wrote about this, um, you know, three months ago, people were talking actively and openly about whether this was a, you know, w whether the euro, you know, would survive this, whether the European Union, Union would survive this. And that's obviously been uh, kind of a, landed in a very different place than I think a lot of people thought. Yes, that is one of the real surprises. Um, you know, we have to correct for the fact that there is a constituency of folks in the English-speaking world who can never wait to restart the conversation about when the euro is going to fail. 
I don't know, never really reconciled to the idea that it was a sensible project in the first place and really expect the, the breakup always to happen. But what was really striking this time was that it wasn't just that constituency. I mean, President Macron of France himself said that this was really a, you know, this was a life and death moment for Europe. And what has been impressive is that they actually moved forward. Uh, th- I am not a cheerleader. I mean, I'm a, I'm a you know, die in the wool, heart and soul European committed to the project of the EU, but I am not a cheerleader for the policy making in the Eurozone on the whole. But it is remarkable that they have managed to turn the crisis in a positive direction. You know, is the compromise they agreed in July enough? Is it radical enough? No. Does it go far enough? Absolutely not. Is this, are we out of the woods yet? No. But nevertheless, they took a crisis and said, no, this is new. This is a new problem. Because it's a new problem, we don't need to dig ourselves into the old camps that we were in when we were dealing with the Eurozone crisis after 2010. And crucially, Berlin moved. So Berlin moved from being a naysayer all the way through April. Uh, Berlin was saying, no, we will not cooperate with the French, the Spanish, the Italians. And then something breaks in late April, early May. Merkel realizes, I think, how deep the, the problems of the Eurozone are and what the risks are. And the Franco-German axis reasserts itself. And on that basis, then you could get this deal. And that is a major shift. It's a positive surprise. It's one of the few good news stories that's really come out at the geopolitical level. But there are, you know, a lot of issues going forward that still have to be resolved because the, the, the price you pay for defining the problem as a new problem is that you bracket dealing with any of the legacy issues. And they have not dealt with and not found a solution for those, which are basically Italy's public debt, which is going to be over 150% of GDP, which, you know, if you Italy had its own central bank would not be a problem, but it doesn't. And so the ECB has to find a way politically of accommodating a large slice of Italy's public debt, because otherwise that's not a sustainable debt burden for a country with Italy's close to zero GDP growth. If Italy had positive nominal GDP growth, it wouldn't be such an issue, but it doesn't. So um, that issue remains fundamentally unresolved. And the main burden of the crisis response is going to fall still on national budgets, even if it is true that the EU has now equipped itself. Nevertheless, you know, politics is a matter of, you know, what can be done in the given moment, uh, in, given the prevailing circumstances, and the Europeans made a remarkable step. Have we seen markets uh, reinforce that sort of fact or, or, or take that sort of view? It's really interesting. Yeah, markets have shifted. Um, you know, it's, it's, I actually had to sort of do a little mental adjustment um, in July because for so long, if you've written about the Eurozone crisis, it's that negative hostile speculation against the Euro, redenomination risk, you know, is, is the big driver. Spread, 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 spread. Um, I know that it's very serious money. Um, is betting the other way now. Um, they seem to actually believe that that uh, that really the, the the Europeans can move this forward. And of course, it's a story of contrasts, you know, because it's a question of whether you want to put your money in euro assets or dollar assets or yen or renminbi. And all of a sudden, a a lot of European assets are undervalued, so you know the pricing looks attractive, and b the 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 exchange rate um, is you know, now increasingly moving in the right direction too. So no, it has been a really remarkable reevaluation. What about China? So the narrative, obviously this is a, a narrative football in a lot of ways, certainly in the US around how to position China as part of this crisis. But you know, in terms of the trajectory that China was on vis-a-vis these other powers, what do you, you know, if you had to put a pin in kind of what this crisis has done, how would you describe it? I know it's almost an impossible question, but. Well, uh, I mean, again, I think it's a, uh... You know, it's a reversal of the narrative because I think in February, the dominant narrative, and I think even in China itself, the concern was that this was Beijing's Chernobyl moment. Um, Apparently, you know, Chinese were using the comments pages of the HBO series to voice Soto Voce criticism of the Chinese regime. Um, So they kind of, you know, they got it. Everyone was on that storyline. Um, and that's not what's transpired. Right? The, the Chinese restored control, even if we allow for the fact that their numbers may be, you know, rather rather favourably inclined. It's it's clear that they contain the crisis far more effectively than anyone in the West. Uh, their economy is the only major economy that's growing. 
They misplayed, obviously, the face mask diplomacy and have run into a buzzsaw of hostility on the American side. But it's unclear to me whether the Americans are really going to be able to take the rest of the world with them. On Huawei, perhaps, because it's clearly a security issue. Uh, But on other issues, it's not obvious to me that they will be able to. And there are large parts of the world where I think the balance has shifted even further towards China than it was before this crisis struck. And I'm thinking Africa is the place which a lot of people were thinking about. But I actually think Latin America may turn out to be more important, especially for the US, because the epidemic there obviously has been grievous. I mean, it's been an absolutely catastrophic hit for not just Brazil, but also the Perus, the Chiles of this world, Colombia. And in all of those places, China's face mask diplomacy, large, generous donations of medical equipment, sometimes with funding to go with them, has gone down much better than it has in in Europe, where it's really met quite a frosty reception. So uh, this is still to be played out, obviously, and we don't know quite how far the uncoupling between the United States and China is going to go. We don't know how grievous the damage to the Chinese tech sector is going to be how far they're going to be able to compensate for the really ruthless pursuit of uh, China's uh, tech uh, industry by the Americans, unprecedented in its its seriousness. But nevertheless, I think from China's point of view, broadly speaking, it confirms their impression that they need to push now. There's a window of opportunity for them to push. And on issues like Hong Kong, we should expect no compromise whatsoever. Um, they were clearly bent already on cracking down on Hong Kong before this crisis hit. And the idea that somehow, you know, opposition from the West is going to make any difference to that, I think, is completely naive. Um, they think they've got leverage. They're exerting very considerable leverage over major financial actors that are straddling that divide, HSBC and Standard, of course, in Hong Kong, but also American money interests are very deeply involved. JP Morgan, the big fund managers, asset managers. So... I think we should expect them to barrel on their way, to be honest. So uh, this gets us to kind of a, a, a theme, which I think goes right back to where we started the conversation. But you wrote one piece uh, called the death, the death of Globalization has been announced many times, but this is a perfect storm, which I'm interested in, in you know, sharing a little bit more about. But the, another line that I pulled from somewhere, I actually didn't even write down which it was in the, the kind of flurry of, of rereading, was this idea of globalization as realism too. And I think this gets back basically to what you were saying about there's no such thing as a post-American American era. Um, but I would love to, to hear your take on this. And I guess maybe the third, a third concept of yours to bring into this is the idea of this is the first crisis of the Anthropocene. Um, because I think that it, it, it maybe will help people understand, you know, again, that this in historical context, to the extent that we can't just draw, you know, easy historical analogy from, but are trying to understand where we might go from here and what this means. Yeah, I, thank you. That's a, that's a, a blizzard of, of, of concept. <laughs> um, the I, I do I, what I meant by this being a perfect storm is very specifically about trade. To be honest, if you use trade as a metric of globalization, I think there's reason to think that we may see not just as it were the stabilization at a high plateau that we've seen since 2011-12 in global trade as a share of you know imports in, imports exports as a share of gdp global gdp in relation to gdp we we could actually see some contraction um, because the forces that drove the extraordinary expansion of global trade um, be they trade policy changes technological changes income growth um, Uh, are all now pointing in a different direction. Uh, And so the perfect storm idea, I think, really was was coined specifically with regard to the issue of trade. On the other hand, the idea of globalization as a kind of fate, as a a reality that we have to deal with, as a non-optional feature of the world that we're in, I think I would also want to insist on in the sense that even if we end up in some sort of profoundly antagonistic, uncoupled relationship from China, you know, our state will be that of somebody who's divorced, not somebody who's never been married. <laughs> those, are, those are two very different conditions uh, to inhabit. Right? We, 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 
we were once profoundly entangled with China and bear the marks of that integration. And of course, large parts of the world will continue to ever deepen their integration with China. So we're talking in that in that mode about changing modes of globalization, changing modes of interaction, not really a reversal, because you can't reverse the condition, right? History is a one-way street fundamentally. Time's arrow moves only in one direction. You cannot put your, this is my personal, as it were, philosophy of history anyway. It's just, it's my, I, I take the side of those who argue with her all the way back to the very ancient Greeks, Heraclitus, that, you know, you can't put your feet in the same river twice. So, to that extent, there is no reversing of globalization, but there could be a moving forward into a new mode of globalization, a new mode of global interaction. And, and that then links to the, the other huge sort of, you know, concept that you tossed into the discussion, which is this idea of the Anthropocene, which is which which is the, the phrase that's been used originally by geologists uh, as a way of, of describing a world so radically transformed by human intervention and manipulation that it will show up at the geological level in due course. If you imagine geologists 2,000 years from now looking back through the strata, they will see the earth-moving effects of humanity. They will see the mass extinctions that we have produced by our massive mobilization of natural resources. And that's obviously a cumulative process. And it goes all the way back really to the first dense periods of human population in Europe, for instance, in Yugoslavia, back to the Roman period, former Yugoslavia, to the Balkan coastline, um, when they were you know, knocking down trees, cutting down trees to build navies. But this intensifies over the millennia. And we have very good reason to think that since the 1950s, it's taken on a new dynamic. And since the 70s, 1970s, ever more so, which brings me back to where, you know, the beginning of our conversation, there is a reality to this massive impact of an increasingly large now 7.8 billion people on the planet living at standards of living far higher than ever before, mobilizing resources ever before. And for at least the last 50 years, we have been pinching ourselves and going, can this really go on? Can this, is this really sustainable? Um, and the answer, of course, is not by most metrics. And of course, we disagree about exactly which one of the things will be the rub and that will stop this process. Could be climate change, could be species extinction, could be um, uh, a, a exhaustion of certain resources. Um, all of those options have been canvassed. But there is also the zoonotic disease mutation route by which our increasingly massive uh, uh, mobilization of, of, of life forms um, spawns um, viruses that will have an absolutely catastrophic impact on humanity. And obviously, COVID isn't the killer virus. It's, it's, it's mildly fatal to a very vulnerable group of population. But it's a harbinger. It's a warning of things which scientists have been predicting really since the 1980s at the very latest, since the AIDS shock, where we began to realize that we hadn't actually exhausted the range of killer diseases, that though we may have triumphed over smallpox, there were other things that could be in the pipeline. And that we would have, uh, that we have some part in the acceleration of what comes through that pipeline. Um, and, and that to me is the significance of COVID is that this isn't a local shock, this isn't Ebola, this isn't HIV, which were catastrophic for certain parts of the world and for certain communities, but not humanity as a whole. This disease isn't even catastrophic measured by those harsh standards, but our response has produced a global crisis of a type we've, we've never seen before. And if this is how we react to this kind of threat, imagine what it could be like if something emerged that truly was you know, far, far more dangerous. Imagine if COVID actually killed young people rather than old people. Um, or middle-aged people in the prime of life, parents, not pensioners, um, what, the, what the dynamic might have been like. So that's, for me, the significance of 2020 is we are seeing our extremely limited capacity to cope collectively with even this sort of a challenge. And there may be, there's every reason to think there's much more grievous things to come. That's a a pretty well, it's a, I guess a little depressing, but a pretty a pretty good spot to to end. But I, I guess I just had one more one more question uh, that's pretty unique to you, I guess. Um, you wrote about the history of, or rather the the way that we misremember or misinterpret or mis eulogize the history of World War II. Uh, 
this year in the in the context of the 75th anniversary of uh, VE Day. And I wonder, as we go into this fundamentally new era, um, whether there are there are histories that we're forgetting or misremembering. And I wonder what history do we need or would be useful in dealing with this world that seems so fundamentally new? I, I, I agree. This is as a historian, this is a problem that 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 you know that I rack my brains over regularly. I mean, I, I think I've already suggested part of the answer, which is that I think we need to move our horizon forward. For me, the history that seems acutely relevant, not in the sense that it provides analogies, but in the sense that if you start there, you begin to understand how we've ended up where we are, is the history from really the late 60s onwards. Um, It's the histories of the 1970s moment, the first crisis of American power, the dawning of environmental consciousness, um, the emergence of a fiat money regime, the moment of the civil rights movement, for instance, and its crises, a truly global world with OPEC as a major force in it. All of that, I think, history is the history of our current moment. By implication, I'm also saying that it seems to me that some of the more familiar reference points, especially in discussions, say, of international money, are less relevant, perhaps, than we generally reckon with. And I'm particularly allergic to invocations of Bretton Woods in 1944 as a useful reference point for thinking about where we need to go from here. Because, I mean, I'm sure your listeners will be only too well, uh, too new, too well aware. I mean, the, the ease with which people will say, well, you know, what we need now is a new Bretton Woods or a new Marshall Plan. Hark back to that kind of epic moment of American leadership on global affairs in the West anyway, between, broadly speaking, between America's entry into World War, uh, uh, World War II and the 1950s, um, is, I think, very unhelpful. That's, that's not the world that we inhabit at all, for better and for worse. I mean, the backdrop to Bretton Woods was both the D-Day landings and the crushing breakthrough of the Red Army on the Eastern Front that was going to wind up the Nazi Germany, um, a level of violence that, that we mercifully have never experienced in our lifetimes um, and, and hopefully never will. Um, so behind that consertion, behind that state power lay violence that that we have to acknowledge and take account of and recognize our distance from. So that would be my, I, I say it's a work in progress. I think it's it's a, it's the task really of the present to, to, to figure out what history is relevant to it. But my bet is that we're going to find that in the last half century, um, because we are on this upward curve, we are on this, what economic historians and environmentalists call the hockey stick. We are on the upward bent portion of the hockey stick. So we are not going to learn all that much by going down to the shaft or even to the moment of the kinking. We need to understand the world that we are ourselves in. Well, Adam, I really appreciate you taking the time today to, uh, to, to try to help us sort through some of that world. Uh, for people who want to follow you more, where can they find you online? Uh, on Twitter. I am at Adam underscore twos, T-O-O-Z-E on Twitter. Wonderful. Well, uh, I'm sure that we will all catch you there. And again, I appreciate your time today. Pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Reflecting on that conversation, the thing that stands out is this idea of there being no such thing as a post-American era. There being no such thing as the idea of the end of globalization. All there is is a new world, a new form of global interconnection that has a very different type of America in it. It seems subtle, it could even seem unnecessary to make that distinction, but I think it is. I think that we need to understand these shifts as evolutionary rather than some radical break with the past. And in fact, the reality is, that's what our history actually tells us. Many of the forces converging now are forces that were set in motion decades ago. I mean, even Adam's invocation of the 1970s as perhaps the most useful starting point for understanding what we're experiencing today is a reflection of that. It can be very appealing, especially as we think of headlines, to talk about things like a post-American era. It can be very easy to try to put the policy of different U.S. administrations in strictly different buckets rather than as a continuation of one another in some way or shape or form. But it may not reflect the world that we actually live in, and to the extent that we want to exert ourselves on the world rather than just have it exerted upon us, I think it's better to define what actually is happening 
rather than try to wrap it up in too neat a narrative package. Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed this interview. We will be back tomorrow with another episode of The Breakdown. Until then, be safe and take care of each other. Peace.